So let's start with uh, the YouTube channel. Just to show you that I'm not, we're not going to actually watch videos here, but this is the place to go on YouTube to learn all about the different individual features. So I'm going to cover them all kind of in a general overview today, but these go very in depth and notice that they're usually under a minute long to show you all the various features of Socrative 2.0. Um, devices that you can use, because that usually comes up right away. Anything that has a browser is fair game. So we're talking iOS, Android, Windows tablets, uh, Chrome on any device. Anything that has a web browser can work. I've even had students bring in e-readers uh, like Kindle devices that have a browser on them and they have worked as well. So what's really great here is you don't need a specific platform. You don't need a certain app store to do this. You just need to get on the web and go directly to Socrative.com to log in. And as I mentioned earlier, the preferred browser is Chrome. Unless you're using an iOS device, then it tends to, in the world of Apple, Safari works well uh, as a browser, especially when it comes to typing. I ran into some issues when it comes to uh, typing in longer sentences when you're not using Safari that, that gave us trouble on Apple devices. So I'm going to lead us off here by doing an intro quiz. I'm going to do a teacher pace style, which means I'm going to control the flow so that we can have uh, information coming at you question by question. Now, the, you're going to see these codes here. These are the kind of like serial numbers, if you will. These are specific codes that get created when you create a new quiz. The purpose of that is if you really like this quiz yourself and you want a copy of it, you can just enter in that code and then now you have instantly a copy of the quiz that, you, that I've made. And it's a separate copy, so if you make changes, it doesn't affect my copy of it as well. So it's a, it's a great, easy way then for teachers to share out quizzes that they make for other teachers to use. And if you do a Google search for Socrative quizzes, you'll see spreadsheets, public spreadsheets out there where teachers will put Socrative codes out there. Um, Edmodo is another great place that I use to, uh, to share information about quizzes that, you, uh, that you've made and others would like to borrow. So let me go to that now. That would be under my start a quiz. I'm going to go to the intro quiz that I've made in advance. Now, I said that I wanted to do this teacher pace, so I'm going to choose that option, but I will talk about the other options here as well. And I have some additional questions here. Do I want to disable student names? I'll say no. That way, I'll, by, uh, by doing it this way, you guys will be prompted to put in your first and last names so I can keep track of how people have responded. Um, randomize answer order. Nope, I'll leave it the way I have it. And then disable student feedback. Um, no, we're not going to disable it. So you will get feedback after each question. So you have granular controls about that, whether or not you reveal the right or wrong answers as you're going. So I will hit start. And now what we need you guys to do to get into this quiz is to go to the website of Socrative.com. And I can demonstrate this also in a secondary window here. So if you go to Socrative.com, and you click the button that says student login. When you click student login, you will not be prompted for any kind of usernames or passwords at all. Yes, question? You could use the app, yes. The app is actually just a bookmark to the web page. There's nothing fancy about it. It's just simply a bookmark that gets you there. So um, don't feel like you're losing out if you're not using the app and you're just using a browser. It's the same experience. So you'll be asked to enter a teacher's room code. The room codes are nice because you can customize them, and I did, so mine is Rob Z, so just four letters. If you type in R-O-B-Z, like the following, and join room, you're now in the room, and it asks you to put in your name. And everybody says, well, what, first name, last name, last name, first name? It, to me, it doesn't really matter. Unless I'm doing this for a grade in class and that I want to make it easy on myself to find the grades, um, I might tell them to put in last names first so that it's alphabetized that way. So then once you are in, you are going to see question number one. And I see people are starting to answer. And I can tell you a couple of things here based on what we're looking at here in the teacher interface. So the number of students that are in the room right now is 41. And these are the numbers that have, are answering right now live. So what I like to usually do in the beginning is kind of give a count around the room. In my classroom, I might have you know, 15, 20, 25 students. I'll count around to know about what number I should have. I think 41 is kind of low. I think there's more than 41 people out there. So if you guys, as, you're, as we're presenting here, you can join in at any time. You don't have to join in at the very beginning. Um, and it'll just pick you up right where we currently are. So again, the room number, or room name, I guess it's up at the top, it's chopped off there, is right at the top there. So if you're just joining us now, Rob Z is the room name. 
and I can see the number went up a little bit there. So we have just about everybody answered. Now, normally in a classroom situation, I would wait until everybody's answered to reveal the right answer. Um, but I think I have it. Did you guys get the right answers as you were going? Did it reveal to you? I think because I chose that option there. Um, I'll go to how do we do, and this will publicly show everybody how we responded. And it looks like for this question here, most people are saying this is their very first time at ISTE, so welcome. And we have some people that have been here a couple of times, some that have been here a lot of times, and then some uh, people that have been here a lot for ISTE conferences. So this one is not a right or wrong type of question. It's an opinion-based question. So when I built this question, I did not check the box that says, like, A is the right answer. You know, if, if that was the case, you would see uh, red and green to show right or wrong answers. But in this case, there are no wrong answers. It's just an opinion-based. And so even as I'm talking now, I can see more people are coming into it, and that's good. So that, that goes to show you that you can walk in the room at any time and log into it and be join the party that way. So I'm going to move us on now to the next question. I hit next on my interface. And now on your screens, you should be seeing, yep, you should be seeing question number two. And here I'm getting a survey of how everybody's, where everybody's backgrounds are in the world of education. And I have five options up there. You can add more. You're not limited to just four or five answer choices. You could put a whole bunch up there. I'm not sure if there is a maximum or not. Um, and speaking of maximums, the number of people in the room, I've been told, I asked the, the Socrata folks yesterday, that Mastery Connect is the name of their um, company. They, they actually bought Socrata about a, a year ago or so. And I was down at that booth yesterday talking to them, and I said, is there a limit to how many people in the room can do this? Because I will have over 50 people tomorrow. And they said, the, the limit is technically 50, 50 concurrent, active, simultaneous users. But they don't really put a hard cap on that. If they have an audience of 100 or 150, the system's still going to allow it to happen. It just may become a little bit less reliable when you have that many people participating. Uh, but I have done this in really, really cool. It was a geography bee where most of the time the 10 kids up on the stage are the ones doing all the work, and the 500 kids in the audience are just kind of sitting there like, you know, oh, this is boring, when's this assembly going to end? So we brought in Socrative, and then we also brought in Kahoot the year later, to give audience interaction. So every 10 minutes or so we would stop and say, all right, audience, it's your turn. Take out your phones, and let's do a, uh, you know, a question along the line. So it was a way to keep the engagement going. So it looks like now we have 57 people in the room, very good. So here's the big reveal. We click on that. And we can see we have, I'm not sure why I turned red. I may have, by mistake, chosen option A as the, I think because that's the default, as the right answer. I, I probably forgot to uncheck that box. That's why there's, there's showing red there. Um, but it looks like the majority of the people in the room are teachers or coaches with some administrators and some uh, tech staff people there. The other category is a tough one because it's like, you know, there's lots of others there. But um, that's a, just a breakdown to show how we're, what backgrounds we're coming from in the room. So question number three now coming at you. This one I wanted to do to show you you can use images. I grabbed an image off the web, and we're saying what famous Philadelphia landmark is this? And we have a lot of different bells in there. And what's nice is you just do a Google image search to find your images, and even if they're very large, they will be scaled down automatically. So very rarely do I find an image that I can't use. It usually works because it, it automatically scales it down to the appropriate size to fit on the small screens. So I will reveal, and let's see how we did. And very good. 90% of people have it with a couple choosing Taco Bell. I thought that would definitely be one to, we would have a couple people choose that. All right, here's our next one. Now, the, this one is an interesting one because you can put in more than one right answer here. The question is, which state is hosting ISTE next year? So you could type in the complete state name, or you could put in the two-letter abbreviation for it, either or. So that, I think this is a higher level type question, because now you really can't just guess and happen to get it right. You really have to know what letters do I need to type in to get this, this one correct. And so, yes, question? Oh, okay. There's no way to change it, no. No, and that applies also to Kahoot. 
for both of those tools. Students ask that a lot. They accidentally hit the button and they meant to hit that. There's no way to undo that. So I, I caution you to use this for actual testing purposes because and when the grade actually counts for the student, that might be something that um, might be a consideration there. I tend to use it mostly for practice events, practice for quizzes, uh, vocabulary terms, things like that. But on occasion, I will use it for an actual test. And by that point, the students have done this a couple times, so they realize what you just said, that it's not possible to go back and change something. So you've got to be very careful what you type or tap. Yes? I believe they are not case sensitive, unless anyone out there can prove me wrong. I, I believe a t uppercase or lowercase is not going to matter. But if you put in spaces or punctuation, that would matter. So that's something to, to consider also. So you might actually put in here what two letter abbreviation is for the state that, you know, blah, blah, blah. So that, that might be a way to refine the question a little further. So now as I scroll through it, you can see what people have typed in. Now this is kind of cool. I can go to show names. So I can see the names of the people and how they responded. And then, let's see, I'd answer. So if, let's say, for example, that MR put in an inappropriate thing in, in what he or she typed in, I could instantly go to uh, hide answer. Because in front of a class, you might need the ability to hide something really quick. So do realize that you can go to hide answers for everybody or individuals and hide names. So it's up to you about what you want to show. Here's the names of the people. Here's the answers. And here's both. And then you have granular controls on the side. So that's kind of nice that they, they give you that ability. And uh, I will be doing that today. Yes, they can. That's called student paste. What you're talking about is student paste. What I'm doing here is teacher paste. And you choose that before you launch the quiz. So you decide, is it going to be an event like this where I'm narrating through it? Or am I just letting you run, run free and do it your way? I'm going to do, we have some examples today. We'll do that. So here's another one with a picture that I showed. And I just wanted to show you that true falses are possible. You could do the true false where it only has true false as an option. But I do like using a multiple choice and adding in the I don't know. So therefore, I can capture if the students, you know, I don't want them to guess. If they really don't know, I want them to say I don't know. And so it looks like we're just about in with everybody. I'll see, how do we do? And there we go, good, false. And did I give you the feedback? Do you know who the actual inventor of the internet is? Yes, OK, so that was a, uh, those are optional. The feedback that you get upon answering, those could be, uh, uh, you, you don't have to put those parts in. But when I built the questions, I put that in, because I thought, what would be helpful for the participants to know right after they answer, to kind of help solidify or cement in uh, that information right after you do it. And that's why I like this kind of thing, because you're not waiting then for days later to get your test results back. You're getting them instantly. And if there's a misconception, you kind of can help correct that right on the spot by seeing uh, the feedback given right after it. And so I believe that brings us to the end of our intro quiz here. So I'm going to hit Finish. And now I have a choice. What do I want to look at? Do I want to look at the report so I can look at everybody's scores? I can view a chart. Let's say Get Reports for Downloading. View chart is viewing it on screen and then going back to dashboard. So if I go to view chart, I can see people's names. I can sort alphabetically. I can sort by score or progress. And individually, I can see just by looking at reds and greens, if there were right and wrong. In this case, there was not a lot of right or wrong answers there. Um, that'll make more sense later when you see one that does have right or wrong answers. And then let's take us back to the dashboard. So that was our intro quiz, just to get your feet wet with what that looks like. I now have a couple of resources that you guys can check out on your, on your own here. Some workshops that I've taught with Socrative going back to a couple years ago in San Antonio and, and uh, uh, FETC in Orlando, some workshops I've taught here. These I typically share out with my grad school students when they're the week that we're doing uh, formative assessment. I have them watch these to get more background like we're doing today. In fact, my, uh, today's workshop will be listed up there too. So the teacher sign-up procedure, if you've never used Socrative before, you go to the plain old website of Socrative.com up at the top under teacher login, and they will prompt you. I'm already logged in. That's why I jumped in. But it'll just prompt you to put in an email address, first name, last name, and your school name. My suggestion to you is always use your school email address if you have multiple email addresses, because that way, they, if they need to, they can verify that you're an actual school user. Uh, there's nothing holding back a student to sign up as a teacher, because there's, uh, I guess there's really no downside to a, a kid 
pretending they're a teacher to create things because there's not so much of a security concern. It just means they can run game shows like I'm doing today. So uh, not to worry so much about that. I know some other services like Edmodo, it's important to have uh, teacher and student accounts separated, but here it, it really doesn't uh, mean a whole lot. It just allows you to run Socratic events. So let me get us back to here. And both teachers and students, either way, you always log in at the entry point of Socrative.com. And there are, as I said, uh, iOS and Android apps. If you search those app stores, you'll see um, apps listed. But there's nothing fancy about them. They're just simply a link back to the web page since they're completely web-based. So we talked this, about this a moment ago about, on the fly, uh, about um, how to have the pacing go, whether it's teacher-led or student-led. So I'm going to lead us through this one first, some on the fly. Um, the advantages of being on the fly is there's no prep that's needed. I can just launch a question. But the disadvantage is I can only do one question at a time, and there's no automatic grading and automatic tracking. So if you need those analytics to see how specific students did, you would want to do it in quiz mode, which is what I, what I did a moment ago when we did our opening quiz. So either on the fly or quiz mode. Um, and let's see. I'm going to do, I'll do an example of the on the fly right now. Let's say I want to ask everybody a quick question. I just click on quick question. I say, what kind do I want to do? I'll do a multiple choice. And this is where on my whiteboard in my classroom, I probably would have the information so they didn't have to do it verbally. But let's say, um, how, many, how many things did you eat for breakfast today? A is going to be one. B is two things, three things, four things, or five things. So think about the plate of food that you ate this morning for breakfast. How many things were on there? And and so I did that verbally, just to save time here. But I may have a question on the board. I may have a worksheet already that I've created. This is just a way to get a quick question out there without me having to do much typing. It's just a couple of taps to launch this. So it looks like most people had one item on their breakfast plate today, with the second choice being about three items on their plate. So that was just a literally spur-of-the-moment question that I came up with there. Usually I do colors or types of uh, uh, food or technology apps or things like that. So that's a quick question that shows us there. Let's say I have another one. Let's do a true-false. And the true-false is going to be ISTE began 10 years ago today. The ISTE organization began 10 years ago today. Is that true or false? And you can see, good, most people are getting that one right. It is false because they've been around much more than 10 years. I don't know the exact, uh, anybody know the exact year ISTE started? NECC? No? Okay. I, I know it was more than 10 years ago. So that just goes to show you, you can click anytime you want on those answers there. And I, well, I might as well do a short answer right now. Um, I'll just say start. And a short answer is going to be, let me see how they show it now. Um, it allows you to type something in. So let's have you type in your favorite app. Your favorite app, whether it be a, a mobile app or a web app. What's your favorite app? And there we go. We got them coming in now. And what I like about this style as they're coming in is, I'm going to show you, this is kind of a two-part. So you're doing part one right now. We're doing a group brainstorm in the room. We're saying, what's your favorite app? Sometimes I do, what's your favorite pizza topping? Or what should be the question on Friday's quiz? Or something that I can get feedback from all the people in the room. Now that we have a bunch there, what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this off by hitting start vote, confirm it. And now you're going to see on your screen a bunch of choices. I would like you to choose the one that's not your own, choose one other than your own, that you think is a very helpful app to use. And so that shall start ranking them. If I did that right, let's see. Yep, you're going to vote on one. And notice what's happening now is what's surfacing to the top are the top votes. So it looks like Edmodo, Kahoot, Twitter, I saw moving there. And as more people are answering out of our 51 participants, and imagine how cool this is with hundreds of people in a room. It's, it's even more data coming at you. Yes, question there? Yeah, the reason why you're seeing that is when we brainstormed in the room, a bunch of people put in Twitter. And so you're voting on, and that, that's one of the downsides here is there's probably, you know, five or six or seven different Twitters in the list there, and they're not all tied together necessarily. So in the room, I usually like to say, um, you know, if we say that Kahoot is the winner, we might look down and say, oh, wait a minute, that might not be the winner because there might be add Facebook there and add Facebook there. You know, it might actually change the numbers. Um, percentage-wise. But that's a good math kind of lesson at the spot. If we say, well, let's see, how did Twitter do? The kids will go through and say, oh, well, we have 8% here, and we have, you know, 3% here and 2% there, and they add them all up to actually see what the finished results are. Yes, in the back? Get these on the student screen. No, only the teacher screen is going to have the, the finished results. The student screen is only going to be used for voting purposes. 
just for input only. Yep. Uh, there's a button around this area that my mouse is at that said start vote or, or begin vote, something like that. So when you're in the short answer style, you'll always see that up there to let you close off accepting entries and move on to a voting mode. And so that was a, uh, a quick little example of that. All right, moving right along. So we looked at the on-the-fly mode. Again, advantage there is no prep. I didn't have to type in any questions at all. But I can't really track how everyone did if I need that data later. So we're going to move on to the quiz mode where I've pre-prepared some quizzes here, starting with our teacher-paced example of digital citizenship. So let me find that one here. Um, start a quiz. Digital citizenship. I'm going to make this one teacher paste. Disable student names, feedback. I'll give you guys the feedback. All right. So you shall be seeing this question now. What personal information should never be shared online by children? And these are, there are right and wrong answers within here. So these are no longer opinion based questions. These have been uh, created so that there are certain. There it goes. The number's starting to climb now. All right, I just, in the interest of saving time, I'm going to jump ahead, even though not everybody's answered yet. Now, the, the disadvantage of jumping ahead is some of you out there that haven't answered yet might look and say, oh, B is the answer. I'll put in B now, and I'll get it right. So I, I, I tend to hold back on revealing the answers until I see majority or everybody uh, has answered. And so B, your address, right? Because it's okay to share your band, your first name, as long as you're not identifying where someone could locate you. So moving on to the next one. And that's what I like about this style is I can have those conversations uh, and see how people answer. Um, and that gives us a moment to help clarify misconceptions. So another multiple choice. If you are being cyberbullied, what should you do? We may have uh, some comedy type answers built in along the way. All right, now I have the big reveal. I hit the button, and you can see the answer is B. With 90% of the room getting that right, I would think at a conference like this, we definitely are going to have the majority of people getting them right, as long as you're answering honestly. Next question coming at you is about fishing with a P. All right, I'll reveal, even though we're not all in yet. And very good. Choice A is the right one. And you should be receiving feedback upon answering these each time. Question in the back? Oh, to get the actual numbers? Not that I know of, no. It's just going to show, in this view, it's going to show by percent, not actual numbers. Yep. Good idea, though. We can mention that as a feature request. Um, the great thing about posting this then online is that stuff like you just said, the people at Socrab, they'll be watching this too. So we'll make sure they uh, see that about having these percents, having those be actual numbers instead. And next question coming at you, number four. And how's the speed? Is, it, is each question coming at you pretty... Yeah, it's, I, I'd say they've, they've done a good job improving this over the years because there used to be some latency involved. You know, I might hit go and I'm like looking at everybody and they're not answering yet because it hasn't been pushed to the device yet. But even here at the conference where we have some you know, kind of tricky Wi-Fi with so many thousands of users, it, if it's working well, that's a very good sign. All right, we'll do the big reveal. There's our choice A. And it looks like a lot of people did the forward to your IT staff. Yes, it's well, an IT staff person is probably going to tell you, nope, we'll be inundated with a ton of emails, so just delete it, and if it's important, we'll send it again. All right, so very good. I'll finish. It looks like that was the last question there, so it brings me to the finish button. I can then do view chart, and very nicely here we can sort it and say, let's sort it by score. Is that how it works? So I'm A to Z first, or Z to A, depending on which way you want to go. And then you can print this out if need be, but you could also download it as an Excel spreadsheet. I tend to download it as an Excel spreadsheet, and because I'm not a fan of Microsoft products, I've gone on the Microsoft Office diet, and I do Google Docs for everything. I throw it into Google Docs, and it, it translates it there for me. So I, I try to, uh, I know it's in the cloud because I know I have it in my Google Docs account, or Google Drive account. All right, so back to.
effect. And we go next here. We're doing a student paced example. So you're going to be working at your own pace now. We're going to do a math quiz. How many math teachers in the audience are math related? All right, a couple. Of, they, they, may, they may have some advantage here. We're going to do our student paced example. Start a quiz. Math quiz. So this time I have two choices when it comes to student paste. I can do student navigation, which means you have the ability to go forwards and backwards in the quiz. Or I can do student paste immediate feedback. Now this little paragraph here does give you more information about the difference. I believe the one I always go with is the immediate feedback because I want you to get feedback right away. Um, so I want you to put in your names. Let's say I'll randomize the question order and randomize the answer order. That means if you look at the partner you're sitting next to, they might not be on the same question and their answer choices are different. So that may help a little bit with the cheating aspect when you can see each other's screens, especially in a lab situation where you have computer monitors and you can look left and right. Um, and then we'll leave the feedback in. I'll hit start. And you guys will begin momentarily here. So it should come up there. There we go. So as people are putting their names in, now this part here, I might in a classroom hide this. Because maybe I don't want everyone in the class to know how far Abby is, you know, uh, and, and how many right answers or wrong answers people are getting. So I would simply turn off the projector at this point, and then the students in the audience would not know where everybody's at. But just for today, I'll leave it open there so you can see very nicely where everybody's at. And because I randomized the question order, that's why they're filling in very randomly in terms of one, two, three, and four. So now as the teacher monitor, I can determine when it's safe for me to move on to the next thing because I can see where everybody's at and how they are doing. And I guess this is revealing the answers too. So if you did look up here, you could see which are the right or wrong answers. And we could hide them like that too so that nobody sees them. And that this way, at least I can see where everybody's at percentage-wise and when they're finished. And then when it's safe to show the answer key, I can click that button, and then the answer key is showing up. And that works in real time. Pretty good. Not much latency there. It's All right, it looks like majority of people are in, so I'm going to just finish it so we can move on. And what happens then is those that didn't finish, which I know some of you didn't finish out there, it just marks the ones that haven't been answered as, uh, as incorrect. But when you look at the spreadsheet of results, you can determine, should I mark those because they were unanswered wrong, or should I just not average them in? It'll give you actually two different numbers. One is how, many, how much right of the ones you answered, and the other one is how much of the overall test. So you have options to see, depending on what your grading policy would be. All right, moving on next is the exit ticket example. All right, the exit ticket is going to be found right from the main interface. And this is meant to be used as a digital version of a paper-based exit ticket that many of us use, including myself. So for this one, there has to be a question on the board. And the question on the board that you'll be asked is going to be, what's impressed you the most at ISTE? What has really impressed you in the past couple of days? So when you get to that question, uh, that's what I, I'd like you to answer. And so did it not push through yet? I, it should start with your name, so it'll ask you for your name first. So it'll ask for your name, it'll ask for that, and then it'll say, answer the teacher's question. And the teacher's question is, what has impressed you the most about ISTE? So on my main interface, I don't think I get to see anything in terms of how far you've answered. Because typically when you launch an exit ticket, you're not watching the main screen. It's maybe the end of class and you just hit that one button on the dashboard that says exit ticket and it's just running. And what it'll do then is save the results for you so after the class, like during the plan period, you can look at the results that way. Now I know that it's taking place right now because notice that the live results is flashing there. That tells me that I'm currently running something, you know, something in the background. So if I click on it, usually it would show you the results. But I think because it's an exit ticket, it's, it's leaving it empty. So let's assume that I'm, I've finished the class. All of you have walked out of my classroom, and now I'm ready to start the next class. I'll hit finish, and it will close it all off. And then I can look at those results under, let's see, they moved it here, manage quizzes, and then right here under reports. 
And there's the exit ticket quiz we just did. If I click on it and click view chart, I can see um, the first choice was uh, picking a letter about did you get it or not. If I click on that, now we get to see the actual responses from people. And then let's take us back to results table. Then for the third one, this was about the teacher's question, what has impressed you the most? And then these are the responses there. And so, again, just like before, you can hide and show names and hide and show answers too. That's more for the teacher after class to analyze then. So I'm going to exit that and bring us back to the main page there. All right, how are we doing on time? All right, we're good. So next up is a little bit of gamification. We're going to do a competitive event, putting you all out there in teams, and it's called the space race. We're going to do this with a science example from the periodic table. So if there's any science teachers out there, they'll have a slight advantage here. So to launch the space race, it's right from the main page. I'll click on space race. And I have some options here, so let's look at them. First, we have to select the quiz that we want to use. And I said I wanted to use my periodic table that I put together for ISTE. Number of teams. And this is actually, it used to be 10 was the maximum, so now there's up to 20. So I have to think about how many people are in the room here. If I want to roughly have maybe three or so people on a team, I'm going to say that I need mm, 10 times 3 would be 30. I've got to go higher than that. Let's say, well, I'll have too many bars if I do that. I'll, I'll just go with 10 teams. There's going to be 10 different color-coded teams in the room. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Do I want to auto-assign or do I want to select the students? If I knew my audience out there, I might go through and look for the high-level and the low-level kids and just say to them, all right, you're on the blue team, blue team, blue team, and then red team, red team, red team, and I would tell them which team to go on. That way, as the teacher, I'm selectively making sure that I have low, medium, and high-level students all grouped together to make it you know, somewhat of a fair competition. But since I don't know my audience out there, like today, I'm going to say auto-assign. So at random, you're going to be put on teams where you're working collaboratively, but you really don't know who your team members are because all you know is what team you are on based on the color code at the top. So if you wanted to, you could walk around the room and say, oh, it looks like you were on my team, you're on the purple team too, and so am I. So you know, that, that would be a way of finding out if you needed to know who you were actually working with. And this is a new option here. It used to be only a rocket, but it looks like now they're giving you other options here. So we're going to try the unicorn. I'm curious to see what that looks like. All right, so there's going to be a little symbol there that gives us on the progress bar as it goes across. Now, hide student right and wrong feedback. Um, I'm going to say, and this is a new option too. I haven't seen this one. I'm going to say, I'll leave it at the default of no. We're, we're going to see the right and wrong feedback as we go. So when I hit start, I believe on your screens, yep, you're going to be asked to put in your name first. And then you are going to see, like in my case, I'm playing on the magenta team because it has the magenta bar up top. And so everyone on your team, once they hit a right answer, the little unicorn symbol goes forward. But if you answer incorrectly, it doesn't penalize you. It doesn't bring backwards your progress. It just doesn't move the little unicorn. So by looking at this on the screen, I can see the, that the magenta team is in the lead with a narrow lead here with a lot of people catching up. And you do have to look. All right, so I know magenta was first. Second place team is uh, teal. And the third place team is, let's see, who, that's why you got to watch because it doesn't tell you. Third place team is going to be close. There's a lot close there. It is going to be the silver team. So we have our first, second, and third place. So it doesn't tell you on the screen and the projector is cutting it off there at the end. It doesn't, I wish it told you first, second, third, fourth. It doesn't do that. So you, as a teacher, you just have to watch and see. And that lets you do a little bit of gamification in your class and I thought this was more of an elementary school kind of thing, but the high school teachers I've worked with and, and the middle school kids in my classes, they love doing this kind of thing because it's, it's a game, there's a competition involved, but at the same time, it's still keeping track of how you've been responding. So if I needed to use this for grading purposes or formative assessment, I can still see how everyone did, even though it was done in, in more of a game show style. And so I'll go to finish. I could say view chart right on the spot, and then I can look at the results of how everybody did, just like that. And if I don't look at this now, not a big deal, because remember, I can always get back to my results under Manage Quizzes, Reports, and I can look back, if I go to All, way back in history from when I started using Socrative, going back to, it keeps going, you reach the bottom and then it keeps going, probably 2012 or so. So for many, many years, all those results are saved. There is no limit, it'll save it unlimited, so you won't run out of space.
things like that. Um, if you want it out of your all area, you can hit the button that says archive, and that just kind of gets it out of here and puts it into the archived reports. And so you have lots of ways to sort these out. I tend to review them by class period because I had because it's done in a twenty some kid uh, event, so I look at them that way. Yeah. Yep. You can, yep. You can keep reusing them just by going to start quiz. Um, yes, I believe. Well, archiving is for the results. I don't think it's for the quizzes. It's just for the results. Yep. You're welcome. So we did our space race example, which now brings us, we showed you about analyzing results and demonstrate steps to create a quiz. So we'll do that very briefly here so you get the idea of the workflow. I would go to manage quizzes and there's the button to create a quiz. I give it a name. And if I want to share it or not with that special code with others, and then it's a matter of clicking multiple choice and I would say, what year is this? There's my question. If I wanted to put in an image, I could do that, and then I could choose from my computer an image. Um, let's see, formatting, if you say yes, allows you to do bold, italics, underline, that kind of thing with uh, special characters. And if you're a math teacher, you might like the subscript and superscript for exponents, but the default is to have that off. And then you would put in your answers. So 1987, 1999. We'll put the right answer here. So then we check the box. And then we'll put in another answer. And if you're not going to use one, you can hit the X there. To add an answer, you hit add an answer. And you could have more than one right answer if need be. Notice that's why there are boxes like that. And then if you wanted to put an explanation like uh, this is the year of 2015, whatever you want to put in for an optional explanation goes there. You do have to remember to hit save, and that kind of locks it in place. So there's my question number one. Adding on a true-false is the same fashion. And then also adding on the short answer, which would not be automatically graded, uh, so do remember that. Um, unless you put in the correct answers. Like when I did the one, um, like what state is ISTE in 2016, I said the correct answers could either be Colorado, and then how did I do it? I think if you do a space, you can actually do the other one too. Or was it, it might be a comma. Yeah, I can't remember if it's a comma or a space. And then, oh, that's, I see, that's what you do. You just go like that, and then I put it down here. And so you can put in multiple correct answers that way. So it's optional. If you do that, then it's nice because you don't have to automatically, it will automatically grade it. You don't have to go in and analyze the results by grading it manually. Somebody asked this earlier, but let's say somebody typed in Colorado in all caps. Mm -hmm. It will be, it, caps doesn't matter. From what I understand, and, and if anybody knows otherwise, I believe it's up, uppercase, lowercase, does not matter either way. Okay. And so. Did it look like it did? Okay. I'm going to stop down at the booth today then and check with them about that. Because I've, I've been asked that question and I thought it didn't matter. But if that was the case, I guess you would want to do like, you'd want to do that and you want to do like that. So you'd have to add in more options that would be more favorable. Um, you could build in the question, say, what two uppercase letters you know, are the state abbreviation for Colorado, something like that to help with that. Um, but yeah, I will, I'm going to find that out too. Mastery Connect is the name of the company that does Socrative, um, and they're in the exhibit hall. So I will check with them today about that too. So that's the, a quick little workflow about how you create them. You hit Save and Exit, and it saves it. So now when you start a quiz, there it is. It's ready to be launched. It'll always put it at the top chronologically from when you used it or, or created it last. And how do you, are you able to share it with the world? Yep, to share it with the world, I would have to give out, uh, let's see, the Socrative number. So if I click on it and say edit, there's that number right there. So I'd have to give out that specific number to people. I could email it to each other. But there's no... What, that's correct. There's no way to have it shared by like hitting a button at all. You'd have to just share that number with people. Yep. All right, so that was the procedure of creating. Some advanced features worth noting is how to customize your room name, how to clear the room, and we just talked about sharing quizzes. So let me show you about uh, making, like I made Rob Z as my room name. I like that because other competitive tools to Socrative do, usually do not let you create a room name or room number. So this is pretty unique to Socrative. Yes? Mm-hmm. 
Not that I know of, no. This is meant to be an individual teacher creates his or her own account and then can manage their own account. But there is no admin overall feature where you can go in and see how all your teachers have done. Uh, Mastery Connect, though, is the company that does this, and they're tied to Common Core Standards. Um, if you talk to them, there is something that you can purchase. I, I think more in higher ed they were ta telling me yesterday that this works with. Um, but you can have quizzes where then each question is tied to a Common Core Standard, so you can search by standard and see what questions people have typed in. But that is one of the paid premium features that you purchase. Everything I'm demonstrating today is done from an individual free account, um, just, uh, just as a point of view. And from what they said, they're always going to keep it free for teachers, the K-12 world, to use. But for corporate world, for higher ed, that's where, you, that's where they make their revenue, is by selling subscriptions to more features tied on to this. All right, so where am I going next? We're going to, oh yes, the advanced stuff. So if we go to settings and we go to clear room, the reason why you would want to clear the room is let's say next period all the students are going to use the exact same iPads in my class. And I don't want someone to walk in and still be using a logged in device from the last class. So I'm going to do it now. I'll hit clear room. And what you probably will see on all of your screens is it bumped you out, where it now brought you back to the main login screen. That's a way of reusing the devices period after period with different kids and making sure that you're not getting data from one kid that actually was last period's student. Does that make sense? Just so you clear it and you, you don't duplicate results. Um, it's in terms of changing your name there. That was found under my profile. And then there it is right there. So you can change your room name. Now, it will prompt you if you use a room name that's already been taken, you know, like Mrs. Smith or something. It'll prompt you that sorry, room has already been taken, and then you can put in a different one. But usually by putting in numbers along with the, the words, you can customize it. So put in your teacher last name and then your room number at your school building, something like that. Um, that would work there. Yes. No, you can only have one open at a time. You sure you were in R O B Z? Because if you, and I don't think case matters with that either. Um, not sure what happened there. Did anybody else have that? We had a different quiz. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. If you're. Were you using Socrative before this session by chance on your device? No? OK. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's only one per class. And, and the reason why is you might leave it open for a number of days. Like before a big quiz is coming up or a big test in my class, I might leave it open all week. So students can go in and keep repeatedly taking the same quiz over and over again. And each time they take it, I tell them, put in Rob Z1, Rob Z2, Rob Z3. So every time they, well, John Smith, if that's their name, they put their name in and then put a number after it. So as I'm looking at the results, I can say, oh, it looks like Susan took it 15 times. And she did very well on her 10th time that she took it. So I will leave an activity going over multiple days or even over the whole day. Um, which is why you can only have one going at a time. The workaround for that teachers have done is just simply create another account, which then allows you to give another room number. So that's, uh, that's a workaround, because there's no charge to create multiple accounts. You're welcome. So, yes? The question itself? Not individual questions, no. You can only share the entire quiz. Yes. You share the entire quiz by doing the Socrative uh, number. So like, for example, here the periodic table one that I did, if I go under Edit, where I can edit my questions, it'll reveal that number there. So that number is what you would need. And now once you have that number, to use it as a new teacher here, you'd go to Manage Quizzes and you'd say Import Quiz. And then there's the place where you type in that number. And it'll import a copy for you. And then you can go ahead and change stuff and delete questions and add to it. So that's your, your way of reusing people's things. I've used this before, import a Socrative quiz from an Excel file. They give you a template you can download, and you open it in Microsoft Excel. You can fill that all out, put all your questions and answers choices in, and then you can upload that back. So here's the button where you would then upload it back in. I did have some trouble with it because you had to have a certain version of Excel. I can't remember if I had a, a newer or an older version. So it's kind of iffy. I much prefer building it using the web interface because it's very streamlined and easy to understand question by question. But that option does exist, just so you know that that, that is out there. It's yours, yes. Yep, and it becomes yours.